morning. <laughs> One good morning, everyone else is asleep. Um, <laughs> my name's Darren, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I live just across the road. I work for the time being uh, at a charity called City Gateway that you might have seen on the front page of the Evening Standard on Friday. We're very happy with that, uh, still in the Evening Standard. Uh, I'm about to leave um, City Gateway, and I'm going to be joining the staff team here the week after next, which is all uh, very exciting. Um, you might be able to hear that I've got a little bit of a cold, which I've been uh, struggling with uh, for the last couple of days. I've actually um, discovered that uh, a cure that actually sort of like clears my sinuses, which is a single malt whiskey. But I thought on a Sunday morning, <laughs> that, that, that might just be a little bit too much. So it's, it's day nurse and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And we are in our series called New Year Revolution. New Year Revolution as we start 2013. And we've been looking at how to be shrewd. I think next week we're looking at how to be just. So uh, Rod is obviously doing that. Uh, and I'm looking at how to be organized. How to be organized. So to see how to be organized, obviously, we have to look at someone who is organizing stuff. We have to look at the person who's in charge of stuff. And the person most in charge of stuff in scripture is the king. It's the king. And the perfect king for us is Jesus. Jesus is God's anointed king. Jesus the Messiah. Messiah means God's anointed king. Jesus Christ. Christ means God's anointed king. And Jesus is teaching us this morning out of the parable of the ten minas. And as Jesus teaches us this, he's teaching us how things are organized in his kingdom. Jesus uses parables to teach, uh, to teach truths. He uses them as stories to teach truth that he wants some people to hear and to understand and to also be able to hide the truth and keep the truth from other people uh, who might not like to hear it. Jesus knows that if he just comes out and says, I'm God's anointed king, the only thing that's going to happen is he's going to get arrested and murdered. And when he does come clean and when he does put that out there directly, that's exactly what happens. So in the meantime, he's teaching his people, he's teaching the guys around him, he's teaching his disciples in parables so that they can understand what's going on, so they can understand what kind of king he is, so they can understand what kind of kingdom he's talking about. So that means that parables are dangerous stories. It means that they're risky stories. It means that they're edgy stories. Everything that we love here at SPS, dangerous, risky, and edgy uh, so, we're going to ask for God's help uh, before we look at this text. We're going to pray together and uh, see what the Holy Spirit can do with us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the way that you're teaching us this morning. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would come and open our hearts and our minds and our lives to what you want to be saying to us. We pray that you would help us, Lord, to offer ourselves to you to be transformed into good servants like Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray against the devil, his servants, his works, sickness, illness, Come, Holy Spirit, and teach us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You might want to keep your Bibles open. That's page 995. And there are basically four characters or four sets of characters in this parable. Four sets of characters. First of all, there's a king, and we're going to look at him first. Then there are some good servants. Then there's a wicked servant. And then there are the subjects. So there's a king, there's some good servants, there's a wicked servant, and then there's the subjects. We're going to go through those in turn, but we're going to start with the king. So verse 11, we're told, Jesus went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. So Luke is telling us 
that Jesus is approaching Jerusalem. Jesus has been going up to Jerusalem, and as he gets nearer to Jerusalem, so people are expecting certain things to happen. There was an expectation that the Messiah, when he came to Jerusalem, would be crowned, that he'd be crowned as king by popular acclaim. There was an expectation that the Messiah, when he came to Jerusalem, would raise up an army, that he would raise up an army and he would use that army to throw the Romans out of Judea. There was an expectation that the Messiah would sort out the temple. There was an expectation that national Israel would be restored, that national power would come back again, just like it had been in the days of King David. That was the plan that they had in mind. That was the template that they had in mind. And Jesus has to teach them. Jesus has to teach them that God's king is not coming in the way that they expect Jesus has to teach them that God's kingdom won't look like they imagine it will. Jesus has to teach them that God's kingdom is not organized around the principles that they think are the most important ones. So he tells this parable, verse 12. A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. Verse 15, he was made king and returned home. So Jesus is the man who is God's anointed king. Jesus is telling this parable about himself. And the scriptures tell us that the last king of Israel is going to reign forever. The scriptures tell us that the last king of Israel is going to rule over the whole earth. The last king of Israel is going to rule over the universe. And this is Jesus This is Jesus who we worship today. This is Jesus who we've worshipped this morning. Not that first century Jewish carpenter, rabbi, but Jesus enthroned. Jesus, ruler of the universe. Jesus as sovereign Lord. Jesus says after the resurrection, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is the king that we worship Jesus is the king who is coming back. Verse 14, but his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. So Jesus is the king who is coming back and he's also the king who is rejected. He's also the king who is rejected. Most of the people who are standing around are going to reject him. Most of the people who are standing around are going to hand Jesus over to the Romans. They're going to have him murdered. Israel has rejected her king. Israel has rejected her king. So Jesus is the king who's coming back, and Jesus is the king who is rejected, which brings us to the servants. And we start with the good servants. Verse 13, so he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. And said, put this money to work, he said, until I come back. So he calls ten servants. He lines them up in front of him. And he gives each one a minna. And a minna is a weight. We don't know exactly how much, but it's a weight of precious metal. What we do know is it's the equivalent, roughly, of 100 days salary for a laborer at that time. It's roughly 100 days' pay for a labourer at that time. So the average pay in London is 30,000 a year. So this is about 10,000 pounds. Yeah, this is about 10,000 pounds. So quite a big gift. This is quite a lot of a lot of money. But this weight, this this 10,000 pounds actually stands for something else. It stands for something much more precious. It stands for something even more valuable. It stands for something of even greater worth. It stands for the faithful lives of the king's servants. It stands for everything that the king has given to his servants. It stands for the life that they've received from him, the faith that they've received from him, the blessings that they've received from him. It's a huge gift from a generous king, and he expects his servants to use this gift to do business for him. He expects them to put this money to work for him. He expects them to organize their lives around working for him, around using this gift of faith and life and hope and money and blessing to use that for him. 
What gifts have we received from Jesus? Sometimes it's helpful just to, to write out in a list, you know, everything that you've been given, everything that you've been given. You know, just to remind yourselves, that's what I've done this week. There's a house, friends, family, job, income, other gifts and skills and abilities. It's a long list when I write that list out because Jesus is a generous king. He's a generous king. And he gives us all of these gifts to work for him and get a return for him on his investment. So how did these guys do? How did these guys do? Verse 16, the first servant came and said, Lord, your minna has earned ten more. Well done, good servant, his master replied, because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Lord, your minna has earned five more. His master answered, you take charge of five cities. So Jesus is teaching us here some principles of kingdom living. He's teaching us some principles of kingdom work. He's teaching us three principles, in fact, of kingdom work, of kingdom living. The first principle is expect fruitful multiplication. Expect fruitful multiplication all through the Bible. This is a principle of life in the kingdom. Genesis chapter 1, God says to our first parents, be fruitful and multiply. Genesis 22, when everything has gone wrong and God is implementing his rescue plan through Abraham, he says to Abraham, I'll make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. Fruitful multiplication. When Jesus sends out his disciples after the resurrection with a great commission, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Fruitful multiplication. The early church, we read in Acts and in history, increased roughly tenfold every generation for the first four generations, from 3,000 Christians in 100 AD to about 20 million by 300 AD. That's a tenfold increase every generation. Fruitful multiplication in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a principle of kingdom living. Fruitful multiplication. And secondly... Second principle, hard work gets bigger rewards. Hard work gets bigger rewards. Maybe some of you think that that isn't a principle of the kingdom. Maybe some of you think that, you know, the kingdom is just about being in the kingdom or not in the kingdom, being in the church or not in the church, being saved or not saved. But Jesus says no. Jesus says no. Yes, we all get, all of the servants get the same one minna to start with. They all get the same gift of faith, the same gift of love, the same gift of hope. But the one who works harder for the king gets more reward. The one who gets 10 minas return gets 10 cities. The one who gets 5 minas return gets 5 cities. The one who works harder for the king gets more. Hard work gets bigger rewards. It's a principle of kingdom living, a principle of kingdom work. Third principle, last one. Be prepared to start small. Be prepared to start small. Verse 17. The king says, Because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. So we need to start by showing that we can do the small stuff before we move on to the big stuff. We need to show that we can be trusted with a little before we can be trusted with a lot. It's a kingdom principle. No one starts with ten cities. No one starts with ten cities to organize, or even five cities to organize. Everyone starts with one minna. Everyone starts with one gift. And that's a principle that we operate in church. So, you know, um, people need to show that they can welcome people into the church before we're going to trust them with the whole of the welcome ministry. People need to show that they can be uh, reliable, faithful, supportive members of a connect group before they can lead a connect group. Those dozen Christians eight years ago that, Paul, that uh, Rick talked about, who were praying that this church wouldn't close, who were praying that children would be seen in this church, they started small. And look at where we are now. 
First Timothy tells us that we need to show that we can organize our households, that we can organize our households and families in prayer, in Bible study, in worship, in godly living before we can be trusted with church leadership. Kingdom principle, start small, move on to big stuff. So three principles of kingdom living, three principles of kingdom work. Expect fruitful multiplication. Work hard to get big rewards and start small. Be prepared to start small. And the good servants live by these principles. They invest their lives according to these principles. But then there's another servant. So we'll come on to him, the wicked servant. And he comes to the king and he says, Lord, here's your minna, here's your 10,000 pounds. Uh, He says, I've kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I found an old tea towel. I've wrapped it in that. I've put it in my sock drawer. I've kept it safe. I've kept it um, hidden. Uh, I've kept it for you. No one's touched it. It's completely fine. Here you are. And is the king going to be happy with that? No, he's not. Because the servant has done nothing. The servant's done nothing. The king has given him this incredible gift. And he's done nothing. The king has told him explicitly to put this gift to work. And he's done nothing. He's been welcomed as a servant of the king. All around him there are other servants working for the gospel to grow the church. And he sat there doing nothing. And the king says, even if you'd put the money on deposit, it would have earned interest and you could have done that tiny thing for me. But this servant's done nothing. And often our sin isn't so much about the wrong things we do. It's about the good things that we don't do. And that's what this guy does. He's received so much and he does nothing. He does nothing. So Jesus is the coming king. Jesus has given his servants gifts. Jesus has given his servants work to do. That work is to invest our lives, to invest the lives of faith that we've been given so that the kingdom can increase and grow. And this servant does nothing. Why does he do nothing? Why does he do nothing? What does he say? He says, I was afraid of you. You're a hard man. What's he really saying? What's he really saying? I think he's saying, not that he was afraid of the king, but that in fact he thought he had a much more reliable plan. He thought the sock drawer plan was pretty solid. He thought that was the way to go. He didn't like what he was being asked to do, so he did something else instead. Is that some of us? Is that some of us? Do we look at this tenfold increase of the good servant, of the first servant, and do we think that is, that's impossible? That's not for me. That's too much. I can't do that. Is that what we think? Let's let's, let's consider that for a moment. Let's consider that for a moment. The king is away for a long time. He's gone to a far country. The implication is that this is a long time. The implication is that this is a lifetime of investment. A lifetime of investment. So this tenfold return from that first servant is a tenfold return for a lifetime of investment. And the best tenfold return that God is interested in is a tenfold increase in people, in lives, transformed by the gospel. That's what God cares about most, people and lives. Not money, not 10,000 pounds, it's people and lives. So a tenfold increase for us would look something like 10 people in our whole lives being welcomed into the kingdom. Ten people in our whole lifetime being welcomed into church, being welcomed into faith. And if we think about a ministry of 20 years, and most people here have probably got much, much more than 20 years, that's one person every two years to invite to Alpha, to bring to Connect, to 
invite to church, to share the gospel with, to talk about Jesus with, it's not a big ask. Not such a big ask. And the servant says, I was afraid of you. He says, I was afraid of you. But I think he's, he, he's he, it sounds to me like he's afraid of something else. He's not afraid of the king as such. I think he's afraid of serving the king who's been rejected. He's afraid of serving the king who's been rejected. He's afraid of rejection. He's afraid of serving the king who's been rejected and that that'll mean that he's going to have to be rejected too. Because the reality is, isn't it, that most of the people that we talk to about Jesus aren't interested. Most of the people that we talk to about Jesus say no. Most of the people that we talk to about Jesus being king don't want him as their king. Most of the people we share with about what God's doing in our lives don't want that in their lives. So the more people we talk to about Jesus, the more we're going to hear no. And the hard part of this work is that we hear a lot of no. A lot of no means lots of rejection. But maybe being rejected is what we should expect as servants of the rejected king. We serve a rejected king. And maybe that means that the work is that we, a lot of the time, will be rejected. What else does this servant have to say? He says to the king, you take out what you did not put in, and you reap what you did not sow. But basically he's saying, you take what's not yours. You're expecting me to give you what doesn't belong to you. My life doesn't belong to you. The fruit of my life doesn't belong to you. My life belongs to me, and as long as I keep it safe and tidy and tucked away in my sock drawer, then we're all good. No. If I'm a servant of Jesus, my life belongs to him. If I'm a servant of Jesus, everything I am and everything I have and everything I get belongs to him. It's been given to me for a short period of time to steward, to look after, to invest. But it belongs to him. We see that here in verse 24. The king says, take his minna from him and give it to the one who has ten minnas. You know, the first time I read that, I thought, Jesus, Jesus can't do maths. <laughs> There's uh, ten minnas. Where, where did the other one go? He should have 11. He should have 11 minnas. He's lost his original minna. <laughs> exactly. It's kind of like, where's it gone? It's like, and I think what Jesus is saying is that everyone is going to lose their original minna. <laughs> you know, basically he says elsewhere, if you hang on to your life, you know, that's a foolish way to go because you're going to lose it. You're going to lose it. Everything you've got in this life is temporary. You're going to lose it. Our lives belong to the king. Our jobs belong to the king. Our families belong to the king. Our homes belong to the king. Everything we have belongs to the king. Everything we have belongs to Jesus. And he's given it to us to invest. He wants us to put our lives to work. He wants us to grow the kingdom by investing into his plans, his project, inviting other people into his kingdom. And that brings us to the last group. The subjects of the king, the citizens of the kingdom, these guys aren't his servants, but he does rule over them. These guys aren't working for him, but he is reigning over them. They hate him, and they don't want him to be their king. And the king describes them as his enemies. Verse 27, he says, those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Bring them here and kill them in front of me. I don't know what that makes you feel when you, when you hear that. I mean, maybe you just sort of close down and think, well, let's ignore this then. Maybe that shocks you, it shocks me. You know, this is one of those verses in Scripture that I just wish wasn't there. But Jesus is saying this. 
Jesus is saying this. And Jesus is saying that he's the king in the parable who's saying this. And I think what he's saying is that serving Jesus or rejecting him is a matter of life or death. I think he's saying that rejecting Jesus as king isn't freedom for me to do what I want. It's not freedom, it's death. I think he's saying that rejecting Jesus isn't life in its fullness. It's death. I think he's saying that rejecting Jesus doesn't bring any reward at all, except death. And if you're unhappy about this, and I'm unhappy about this, let me promise you that Jesus is even more unhappy about this. You might want to look down to verse 41 to 44. Jesus is moving towards Jerusalem. He's walking towards Jerusalem. And as he gets near, he stands opposite Jerusalem. He stands opposite Jerusalem and he speaks to Jerusalem. And he says, I'm your king. I've come to bring you salvation. I've come to set you free. I've come to rescue you into my kingdom. And you won't even recognize me. You won't even recognize who I am and what I want to do for you. And you insist on doing things your way. You insist on doing things uh, the way that you've always done them. And because of this, the natural outworking of this is that the Romans are going to come and the Romans are going to destroy Jerusalem and the Romans are going to kill everyone in Jerusalem. And this will be because you haven't listened to me, you haven't recognized me, you haven't done what I asked you, you haven't received my offer of peace. And Jesus doesn't say this in anger. And Jesus doesn't say this with any pleasure. But Jesus speaks these words over the people of God, over Jerusalem, and then bursts into tears. And then bursts into tears. Because that's how much Jesus cares about the lost. That's how much Jesus cares about people who don't want to say yes to life and choose death instead. That's how much Jesus cares. I would love us as a church to have that heart. That's how much Jesus wants us to be sharing the gift of life. That's how much Jesus wants his servants to be investing, to be investing, to grow his kingdom. That's why he's telling this parable at this point. He's saying, rescue some of these guys, get busy. So Jesus is the coming king. Jesus is the king who was rejected. Jesus is the king who was ready to die for his people. And he died so that we could have the gift of life. He was faithful so that we could have the gift of faith and he gave it to us, his servants. Jesus is so generous with us. He's been so generous to us as a church over the last eight years. He's rescued so many people. He's blessed so many people. He's blessed all of us together as a family. He's healed us. He's restored us to fellowship with him. He's forgiven us. He's poured out generous grace on generous grace on generous grace. And he asks us to carry on that pattern of generous grace to organize our lives around investing for the king, sharing his generous grace with everyone who hasn't received it yet. And then as if that's not enough, he rewards us with even more generous grace, five cities, ten cities, I don't know what that means, but it's big. Generous grace, on generous grace, on generous grace. And the world needs us to be doing this. Shadwell needs us to be doing this. Shadwell needs us to be busy sharing the gift of life in God's kingdom. Shadwell needs us to be organizing our lives around investing for Jesus, around investing for the kingdom, around inviting people in to God's kingdom and blessing and generous grace. So we can see fruitful multiplication. 
So we can work hard, yes, but to get big rewards. And we can start small and see big things happen by God's grace. Shall we stand together? The band like, might like to come up. And shall we just recognize that we're standing before our generous king? And he's giving us so much even today. Homes, families, faith, the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. And maybe investing a whole life feels like a very big ask for some of us. Maybe that feels like too big a responsibility. Let's remember those kingdom principles. Let's start small. Let's start small. If a lifetime of sharing the gospel feels too big, maybe we might just talk about Jesus with one person. One person. Tell them who Jesus is to us what he's done. Maybe we might join a connect group, invest in other Christians. Maybe that feels too big, start small. Go to a connect group once, once, one evening, two hours, investment. Start small. Maybe committing to church community even, committing to the shared life of this community might feel too big. Why not just turn up 15 minutes earlier next week? Encourage someone. Say something nice to them. Say something positive. Start small. Kingdom principle. Maybe praying every day feels too much. Just pray once. Start small. Kingdom principle. Let's pray together.